I've been doing this for 25 years, having watched these patterns a few times, I'm just very confident that there's not going to be a substantially better economic opportunity over the next 20 years than Bitcoin. From a risk management and from a value-oriented perspective, I'd rather be long Bitcoin than, than AI companies. Not because I don't think AI is great, it's just I think it's fully priced in. I think most of what we know about AI's value to society for the next five years is mostly priced in. I could be wrong about that, right? It could be bigger, but even if it's bigger than expected, the, the prices are sort of saying that already. Whereas in Bitcoin, the price is sort of saying Bitcoin may not matter very much, and I think that's going to end up being wrong. You can actually use Bitcoin as a monetization method for power that otherwise wouldn't be economical. Everybody's focused on renewables anyway, but the question is how do you make them actually competitive? Well, one way is to, to, to use Bitcoin at every access point, essentially, to your energy network that is currently under monetized. Introducing the Blockware Marketplace. Start mining Bitcoin today. This has the potential to transform the mining industry as now anyone can buy a Bitcoin ASIC using on-chain or Lightning, see its historical and live hash rate before purchasing, and be earning Bitcoin mining rewards in minutes. This brings transparency and turnkey mining to a whole other level. Start mining Bitcoin today at marketplace.blockware.solutions.com. Com. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Blockware Intelligence Podcast. This week I have on Mike Alfred. Mike, what's going on? Not much, Joe. How you doing? Just enjoying the summer here. I love it. Yeah, doing good on my end. Let's go ahead and dive right into it. Um, starting off with like a, a maybe a little bit of a different question, but um, I know your your LinkedIn headline is value oriented investor with a long term perspective. Why this strategy? Yeah, look, I've been thinking about investment markets and investing itself for 25 years now. I first kind of became infatuated with it just before I left to go to Stanford in the late 1990s, traded all the way through the tech bubble, uh, learned about Vanguard, learned about Buffett, read security analysis, you know, after graduation, worked as a financial advisor, you know, went to, to Omaha in 2010 uh, for the Berkshire shareholder meeting. Watch the rise of these tech-driven Tiger Cub hedge funds like Tiger Global. Followed their 13Fs for you know the last 15 years, and just you know as I've summarized 25 years of thinking about markets, I think generally being value-oriented generates alpha over long periods, right? So whether you're Buffett or whether you're Icon or whether you're Ray Dalio or Chuck Acre or any of these like world-class uh, investors, you know Paul Singer, etc., they all tend to tilt value. Or, uh, oriented in general, they, they're looking to basically buy a dollar for less than a dollar, right? They're looking to systematically kind of stack the deck and generate excess returns across time. And it turns out chasing bubbles, chasing growth, chasing fads tends to detract from that over a long period. So even though you may beat the market over three years during a boom period or a bubble period, if you give all those gains back every cycle, um, you don't compound at the same rate across decades as the truly great value-oriented investors do. And so I think about the world in terms of expected values. And so as I look at my career, I want to invest for the next 40 years just to make sure that I win and to make sure I generate alpha. I think starting with a value-oriented perspective uh, systematically stacks the deck in your favor if you're looking always to buy things that, that have fundamental value. Now, that can be different for an asset versus a company, right? If you're analyzing why is Bitcoin better money versus why is uh, you know Microsoft a better company than than Apple, et cetera, right? Like that's just a hypothetical. Uh, but it turns out that if you go deep enough and you spend decades of your career on this, you tend to get pretty good at being able to assess those relative values and mostly avoid things that do not offer fundamental value uh, at the time of purchase. And you know, it turns out that over long periods of time, the price paid at the entry of an investment is one of the most important uh, factors. You can buy a world-class company, but if you pay peak multiples for that company over 10 or 15 years, you'll, you're likely to underperform. You can buy a company that's not even world-class, but just a good company. But if you buy it at the absolute trough of the earnings cycle, when the multiples are completely compressed, you get this, this dramatic uplift simply from the valuation reset, separate from any growth in that business and any change in perceptions in the investor community that re-rates the stock higher. So I'm just looking to systematically win uh, in investment markets across decades. And so I, I, I don't eschew growth, right? I'm not afraid of innovation. Uh, I was a big believer in Google 15 years ago, right? A uh, big believer in Bitcoin, as you know. And so those are 
things that, you know, like Buffett didn't understand Google in 2010. He didn't understand Apple until 2013. Uh, Seth Klarman and Buffett don't understand Bitcoin today. If you can sort of watch what Klarman said on CNBC, I think it was yesterday. And so, you know, it, it turns out that like across long, long periods of time that, that value matters, but it, not at the expense of, of completely uh, n- neglecting to understand growth and completely neglecting to understand new categories. And so I think if you can bifurcate your brain and say, look, uh, innovation matters, technology matters, AI matters, Bitcoin matters, but also valuation matters, rigor matters, discipline matters, being systematic matters. If you put those both together across a 20 or 30 year period, I think you'll you'll have exceptional returns. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely a, a big fan of your strategy. I think it makes a lot of sense. If you like had five, 10 minutes to sit down with Buffett, how would you explain Bitcoin to him? Because like you said, you know, it's Bitcoin is not a company. It has no future cash flows. Um, and that's kind of what he's looking for when he, I guess, values companies and wants to buy those future cash flows at a discount to what the market is currently trading at. How do you, you know, how would you explain Bitcoin to him? So first off, if I had five to 10 minutes in Buffett, uh, with Buffett, I wouldn't spend a, a minute. I wouldn't spend 30 seconds talking about it because I think it's a waste of time. I think it would color his view of you as a, more broadly as an investor. Um, frankly, I don't think it matters if Buffett understands uh, Bitcoin because he's 91 or 92 years old, right? Munger's like 98 or 99 years old. And so there's at this point, like mathematically, even if they knew that there's a chance that Bitcoin's correct and Bitcoin's going to win and Bitcoin's systematically better, the math just says, given their remaining lifespan, that that's not an important question. Therefore, that's why they punt on it. They, they don't necessarily need to understand it. Even if they did understand it, it wouldn't necessarily change their portfolio. So, so I wouldn't, again, to, to answer the question directly, I wouldn't spend a moment talking with, with Buffett if I had 10 minutes. I would try to get him to speak about something maybe he hasn't spoken about publicly. I'd probably share a little bit about my story and ask him, what, given what you know about me at, at, my, at my age over the next 40 years, how would you be thinking about the future? Because I already know what I think about the next 40 years. But what would be interesting is to hear what he would think uh, about that, right? And so it, it personalized a little bit more. That said, if, if forced to, at gunpoint, use up my 10 minutes with Buffett to talk about Bitcoin, I would point out that for decades now, people have been asking him about the Fed. They've been asking about the strength of the dollar. They've been asking about the the end result of tens of trillions of dollars of debt being stacked on the U.S. balance sheet. And if you really believe, like he did 50, 60 years ago, that the U.S. is going to be as great of a company 50 years from now as it was 50 years ago, you have to ask yourself, how do we know that the government is sort of doing the right things, given the amount of debt, uh, given the amount of fiscal stimulus, given the way the Fed has sort of manipulated monetary policy, raising and lowering interest rates, printing money seemingly at will. And I'd say you've even alluded to that, right? You've said common stocks are a better way to essentially store value across time. And he's proven that by beating the S&P, doubling it over, over 50 plus years now. And so I would say, look, I, I would say you're, you're, you're probably right to, to be aware and to be concerned of those things. But if Bitcoin could potentially be the antidote to some of the government, um, you know, some of the government issues that have come up and are be sort of becoming more clear to people broadly, and that's why people are asking about it at the Berkshire shareholder meeting every year, um, p- perhaps you know, trying to understand what it is and how it's different than other fiat monies uh, might be a useful thing to do. But again, I don't think mathematically it makes sense. I don't think he has enough time for that question to matter. And so if I had 10 minutes with him, I certainly wouldn't bring up Bitcoin. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on on another topic, the the BlackRock ETF? I know you've, you've tweeted a little bit about how GBTC could be an interesting trade here with it trading at it, you know, a few weeks ago is a pretty massive discount. Now the discounts coming back up. Um, what are your thoughts on the BlackRock ETF and maybe how that relates to GBTC? Yeah. So I mean, this is definitely one of the most interesting things happening in the broader Bitcoin uh, ecosystem. And, you know, as I've disclosed before, I have, you know, well over 240,000 shares of GBTC. So I'm not, I'm not sort of uh uh, completely non-conflicted, right? I, I want it to go up. I think it should go up over time. I think it's just Bitcoin. It's actually the closest derivative to Bitcoin because it's just Bitcoin held in cold storage at Coinbase in a trust structure that's sort of bankruptcy remote. 
So, you know, the biggest risk is actually Coinbase loses the keys or Coinbase gets hacked, right? Grayscale itself is not really, you're just, you're buying a brand and a structure when you put a dollar in a GBTC. And so look, I never viewed it as buying Bitcoin at, at a discount because I'm not sure you ever get Bitcoin if they don't unwind the trust to the extent at which there are catalysts that could cause the trust to be unwound, then it becomes more like Bitcoin, right? So along the spectrum of, to a synthetic Bitcoin that's several layers removed to an actual Bitcoin held in cold storage, GBTC is not far from actual Bitcoin, but because of that trust structure and because Barry and Michael at, at Grayscale have no incentive financially to unwind it until you see a clear path to somebody kind of new ownership, new management of that trust, uh, being able to, to pull levers in order to unlock the intrinsic value of the underlying Bitcoin, that you shouldn't be sort of necessarily betting on it as, as Bitcoin. So I, I, look, I, I look at it as an individual security. I'm confident in the underlying assets. I'm confident in the underlying custodian. Um, I think it's telling that, that you know, if you, if you think about what's going on with BlackRock, BlackRock chose Coinbase as its custodian for this ETF. I think they will diversify in the long run, but I think their bet on Coinbase is important because it shows the need for a true independent custodian that's not conflicted with the traditional asset managers. You know, like BlackRock could use Fidelity as the custodian, but it turns out BlackRock and Fidelity are highly competitive across other investment marketplaces. They're, they're competing globally to distribute their investment products, their large cap value fund and their small cap fund and their index funds and their insurance products or their, their products that are put into insurance company products, right? Their asset management products. They all have platforms, right? So Fidelity's got a, a large U.S. retirement platform. And so BlackRock's trying to sell uh, mutual funds into those 401k plans. They don't necessarily want to you know, use their competitor uh, as a custodian. And so even though Coinbase got sued by the SEC, right, the stock's actually gone up in, in recent weeks. And I think that's quite, quite telling. You look, the BlackRock ETF, if it gets approved, would be a big deal. I think BlackRock is aiming to get a place in line. They sense correctly, I believe, that, that it's highly likely that Grayscale will win their appeals uh, suit with the SEC. I listened to the entire last hearing. I left that hearing thinking um, essentially all three of the judges that are representing um, the government uh, essentially you know, don't see any uh, merit to the arguments the SEC is making, that functionally a futures-based ETF is, is the same as a spot-based ETF, and that manipulation that happens in one market should potentially impact the other market. And it's a pretty specious argument from the SEC from the beginning, but I think as we all know, this is this is often highly polit politicized. And so the reasoning why the SEC may be pushing one angle over another may not really be backed by the law. That said, if, if the SEC suit uh, with Grayscale goes Grayscale's way, that would open the door to an eventual approval. And I think BlackRock smartly wants kind of be first in line or wants to be near the front of the line given the fact that they're highly likely to be one of the first that's approved, if anything is going to be approved at all. Um, you know, so, so I, I give it like a pretty high odds of being approved over a year or two, like somebody's going to get an approval now. And I think that's what the market is pricing in with GBTC, right? So they're, they're pricing in that even if it's not GBTC initially, that the, the sort of winds of change are coming. We've got an election coming up. So it's possible that in 18 months, the current SEC chair isn't there anyway in which case a new regime might have a totally different bias uh, towards this sector. Either way, it's all going to line up, Joe, with the sort of having cycle and what we would consider to be a traditional bull market period likely to happen in 2024, 2025, 2026. Turns out sometimes it doesn't really matter exactly what the news flow is if it, if it aligns with sort of what is likely to happen structurally anyway, based on time, based on patterns, based on seasonality, based on behavior actors. And so... I don't think it necessarily matters whether it's approved. I think the ball is sort of in play now for something to be approved. And even separate from that, we're entering a Bitcoin bull market. That's sort of dead clear to me now at this point. And so over the next two years, it's more likely that positive things start happening than more negative things start happening. And we've already seen that over the last six to sort of nine, seven, eight, nine months, where even in the, in the face of bad news, Bitcoin has sort of bottomed and started to go higher. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it definitely seems, you know, from me being in Bitcoin that this is like the highest probability of an ETF ever being approved. Like it's, it's closer to the finish line than ever before. So, you know, fingers crossed, we'll see what happens. But on the other note of, of custodians and losing keys, I guess you saw the, the prime trust news. Do you have any thoughts on, on, on that? 
What's the latest thing? I mean, what I saw was they essentially shut withdrawals. They had a 12 or $13 million hole in their balance sheet. There was some speculation that that might've been caused by a loss of keys. I'm not sure it's just not bad lending, bad counterparties. Yeah. From, um, what I've, from what I've read, it's management basically said that they had access to a legacy wallet, legacy wallet that they were using in the past and then funds got sent to it. Then they didn't uh, have access to it. And then that was like two years ago that they found that out. And then they used dollar deposits, I guess, from clients to buy Bitcoin to send to people. Um, and there's like a massive hole in their balance sheet from what I've seen. So when you say massive, did, did you get a number? It may be like 50 million or something like that. It was, it's more yeah. than 10 million for sure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, two, two days ago, cause I'm not following the news that close right now. I'll, to be honest, I'm really focused on my investment thesis. I, I got a little off track over the last year or two following too much of the mainstream news and being too knowledgeable about every uh, <laughs> detail, <laughs> but I'm actually trying to pull back from that because I don't think that's going to help me generate alpha. Uh, that said, you know, like, look, no, no custodian, uh, in crypto, the crypto native custodian can completely be trusted. As I've said before, I think Coinbase is probably the best counterparty in the ecosystem. They've got billions of dollars in, in cash, right? They, they did an audit from the beginning even before they went public. I think it's pretty clear that like mo they're holding the assets one-to-one -one there. Most of the other custodians, I'm, I'm not so certain, especially the offshore lightly regulated ones. Again, I put finance and FTX and crypto.com and Huobi and OKX and all these guys tether kind of a similar category. It's not, it's not necessarily clear that for sure they don't have all the assets. Um, but, but we just keep finding out about more and more firms that are just not running their business with any proper internal controls, right. With any, uh, proper risk management frameworks at all. And so they just keep losing the customer's money. Uh, so I, look, uh, I, I, I'm on the fence on this because I think for a lot of institutional use cases, you do need to use a custodian. So on one hand, I, I recommend to people that they learn about self-custody and they learn about how to hold their own keys. On the other hand, I realize that a lot of people are never going to do that. And for a lot of institutional use cases due to audit and internal controls, like you kind of have to use a third party. Otherwise, um, you know, you can imagine a scenario where a publicly traded crypto company, the CEO is the only one that has the keys. And it's like, that's great as long as the CEO isn't a criminal. That's great as long as the CEO doesn't die suddenly on a hiking trip, right? That's great as long as the CEO doesn't get hit in the head and forget everything. Um, and we've seen that. We've literally seen that with like um, Quadriga CX where like the CEO just died, right? And it's not clear that he didn't lose all the money and steal all the money before he died. Uh, it's not even clear that he's dead, although people have said they've seen his, his body. But like custodians matter, right? And so it, it's a tough conversation because on one hand, I tell people like, custodians matter and, and we need to have good custodians. On the other hand, I say one of the things that's great about Bitcoin is you don't need a custodian. Um, and so it's, it's complicated, but look, I, ho I hope they figure out the prime trust uh, situation. I hope uh, more customers don't lose a lot of money, but that's the nature of the beast uh, at the early stage in a new category like this, where there are a lot of people running around offering services that are not really institutional quality. Yeah. Do you think there will be more like, institutional multi-sig like products where maybe you know the ceo doesn't hold like all of the keys but maybe the company has access to like one key that you know has and then it's maybe like a two or three multi-sig or like a three or five multi-sig where like different like fidelity holds a key jp morgan holds a key or whoever holds a key and then it's like they have visibility that their Bitcoin exists and is not getting like loaned mm -hmm. out, but they don't have like complete access over it. Do you think that that's like something that's going to happen or, or no? Well, I mean, it's already happening, right? I mean, Unchained Capital has been talking about, you know, collaborative custody for years now. I don't think the traction has gotten there with the biggest firms because the biggest firms benefit from just choosing a, a Fidelity, a Coinbase, a Paxos, an Anchorage, et cetera. And, and just using them and, and trusting that, that they don't, they won't lose it because then their liability is sort of lower. Like when the company chooses to own their own keys, if, if a mistake is made, it's on them. If, if you put it with Coinbase and they make a mistake, it's on, it's on them, not you. Um, I'm not saying that one necessarily is better than the other, but it's about who holds the liability. And so I think as a management team trying to de-risk themselves, 
uh, if you could find world-class tier one custodians so that you can just offload that part of your brain, essentially, you still need to think through your security posture and your security orientation internally as an institution or a large corporate, like how are you going to interface with that custodian? Cause that's where something could go wrong. And a rogue employee could contact that custodian seemingly on your behalf. Right. And, and move Bitcoin out, even though you have it in a safe custodian, uh, the access point is, is, is sort of compromised. Um, so there's just a lot of thinking that needs to go, go into that. And of course, audit is going to be one of the biggest parts that drive it to the extent at which auditors are comfortable with that collaborative key model. It'll be adopted more widely to the extent at which auditors recommend it'll definitely be adopted, right? Because people want a clean audit every year. It's one of the reasons why the Prime Trust BitGo acquisition didn't go through. Remember, even before that, people are already forgetting this, but Galaxy was supposed to buy BitGo and, and BitGo was not even able to, to deliver their audit uh, on time for that year. And so, you know, that, that, that was a $1.2 billion transaction with a public company buyer and, and it fell through quietly. Right. And I think Bitcoin, pro Bitcoin is probably one of the better custodians, but even they are having trouble doing the audit. Some of that is the auditors are not good at auditing crypto companies. They're much better at auditing fiat bank accounts. That's easy for them. They've been doing it for, for decades and, it, and it's, it's, it's something that like, doesn't have a lot of complexity to it. The, as soon as you start having foreign currencies and then multiple digital currencies, of course it gets a more uh, complicated because there's way more exchange rates. There are way more custodial environments, right? Some, Coins are held at one custodian. Some are held directly on chain, right? These these exchanges are, are holding them, holding the keys them, them, themselves. So they have to prove they hold the keys. How do you do that without exposing keys to wallets that hold billions of dollars of crypto? So there are legitimate reasons why doing an audit is hard. But I think over time, they're, they need to be worked out, right, in order for the space to really grow up. And so to the extent at which the collaborative model is with multiple key holders is built into the audit, it's built into the internal controls, it's, it's considered to be best practice by CFOs of companies that hold digital assets. I think, I think it will be adopted. Sure. Very cool. I know you and your, uh, fund are highly interested in Bitcoin mining, uh, as we are at Blockware. Um, what do you think is like the largest opportunity within the Bitcoin mining industry right now? Hey everyone, this week I want to talk about stamp seed. This is very cool metal plate where you can literally stamp your Bitcoin seed phrase with this hammer that they sell you into this metal plate. This is a must have for all Bitcoin holders. If you have taken self custody of your Bitcoin, you want to make sure you've recorded your seed phrase on something that is fireproof, waterproof, and time resistant. This is a great product for Bitcoiners who have taken self custody and want that extra level of security and resiliency to store their Bitcoin. So if you are interested in this product, definitely check out stampseed.com. Use code BLOCKWARE15 for 15% off the entire website. Um, so yeah, I mean, look, uh, Alpine Fox LP, my, my fund, um, is a heavy investor, right? Like We're actually one of the largest outside investors in a handful of the, of the public Miners. In one case, we actually own more shares than Vanguard and and, uh, and and BlackRock, right? They have like three million and two million, and the funds holding three point eight million, right? So, um, you know, I've decided to concentrate pretty heavily. I view this industry as being like the traditional internet data center business after the dot com bust. You were probably a, a young man, a uh, very young guy at the time, but you know, when I was at Stanford in the late nineties, that dot com bubble first blew. And then it, and then it busted and between 2000, March of 2000 and sort of early 2003, you couldn't find anybody who's interested in internet stocks because they were all down 80, the good ones like Amazon were down 80, 90% plus and the, and the bad ones had gone bankrupt, right? The web vans and the pets.com. And so the, the mood on the internet was extremely sour at that time, but it turns out that was the best time in the last 20 years to make large scale investments in internet businesses and, and importantly, internet infrastructure businesses, right? So there's a company called a, a, Aquinix, ticker ZQIX. The stock traded at $3 in 2002. At one point, a few years ago, it was trading at $900. So it was a 300X. And when you think back at that time, literally you were just making a binary bet on would there be any useful reason to use the internet? Like would the, would the internet become a large scale tool used by everybody in the world? Uh, would the internet sort of, would the consumer internet drive uh, commerce across the world, right? Would would people buy cars? Would they buy airline tickets? Would they would they communicate primarily through the internet? That was not a consensus bet 
2002, 2003. In fact, everybody was negative on the internet at that time. But betting on Equinix then was literally just a light switch on off type of bet on would the internet be bigger or smaller? I view the Bitcoin data center business, the Bitcoin infrastructure business today in 2023 being almost exactly like the internet business in 2003. And in particular, the, the mining business is sort of like the data center and infrastructure business for the internet back then. So what are these miners doing? They're essentially buying or leasing land. They're buying or leasing buildings. They're, they're uh, building energy infrastructure. They're pl plugging into the grid, right? They're building substations. They're, they're buying transformers. They're linking that all together. They're doing all the heat engineering, all the electrical engineering, all the piping. They have to keep the machines cool. They've got to source the machines. They've got to point their hash rate at a, uh, at a mining pool. They've got to monetize that. And they got to pay their power bills and pay their people and keep building, right? And so there's a land acquisition component for the, for the true infrastructure developers. And, and I think I should delineate here between the kind of asset light providers that don't own the land in the buildings, right? And, and the folks that are, that are really doing that. I, I tend to want to bet on the infrastructure uh, companies because again, from a value oriented margin of safety standpoint, if I own land and buildings that are worth $200 million um, and during a period of time where the Bitcoin price is low and so mining doesn't look that profitable and I can buy the equity for a hundred million dollars, like I could, by the way, for several miners uh, in December of last year and going into Q1 of this year, then I have a, a embedded margin of safety because uh, even if Bitcoin mining never takes off, which I think it will, but if, let's say Bitcoin mining were to cap out, it was never, never a bigger business than it is now. I have the margin of safety of owning the land and the buildings and those can be, re those are long lived buildings so they could be repurposed uh, to do AI, to do high performance computing, to, to do other uh, sectors of the economy. That said, if Bitcoin tends to do what it does almost every cycle and that is appreciate in fiat terms uh, and do and, and in sort of an exponential explosive way, then for periods of time, say 12 to 18 months, these businesses are literally printing money. I mean, they're printing their whole market cap uh, in a year, potentially, if you look back a year or two from the peak of the cycle. And so, you know, I want to be long uh, those businesses. I, I think, again, I think it's a very uh, similar analogy to, to investing in the internet data center business in 2003. I think it has a 20 year plus runway. I think a lot of the money though will be made from people who had the guts to buy those stocks over the last six to nine months when nobody wanted them, when they were trading for less than the net assets. Um, and you're betting on the optionality of owning infrastructure that's devoted at this uh, monetary network that and computing network uh, that is likely to grow substantially, at least in dollar terms. Uh, so I like it. I like the, the setup a lot. I've decided to you know, focus the fund pretty heavily on that sector. It's not all the fund does, but uh, you, it, when you see something that looks this big, Again, like I've been doing this for 25 years with my own money almost now, right? And so having watched these patterns a few times, I'm just very confident that there's not going to be a substantially better economic opportunity over the next 20 years than this, um, than Bitcoin. I think, I think uh, AI potentially is as big, but I think AI stock prices, um, and public and private, and sort of any AI derivative is already priced like it's going to be the biggest thing in the world over the next 10 years. And I'm not so cer certain that that's the case. I think it might be more like 1998, 99 for AI and more like 2003 for Bitcoin. Uh, and so from a risk management and from a value oriented perspective, I'd rather be long Bitcoin than, than AI companies. Not because I don't think AI is great. It's just, I think it's fully priced in. I think most of what we know about AI's value to society for the next five years is mostly priced in. I could be wrong about that, right? It could be bigger than expected, but even if it's bigger than expected, the, the prices are sort of saying that already. Whereas in Bitcoin, the price is sort of saying Bitcoin may not matter very much. And I think that's going to end up being wrong. Yeah, we're definitely in some sort of uh, AI hype cycle right now, for sure. Um, I, f I feel like I've been thinking this, like the true bottom in Bitcoin mining, if it hasn't already occurred, would be like a large public miner just completely pivoting to being like an AI infrastructure provider instead of, you know, just completely dropping Bitcoin, but hopefully we won't see that happen. No, um, yeah, nobody's done, nobody's done that yet. Northern data hut and others have already done AI deals applied, applied digital. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Iris had a, had a, you know, a, a memorandum of understanding with, I think it was Dell computer, like way back in 2019, uh, basically on this subject. So, so like, if you're an infrastructure developer and you're a data center developer, you're sort of agnostic to what you actually use, right? That, that computing power for, like you could plug in 
NVIDIA chips and now you're an AI provider. So again, you know, from a, from a, mar what I love about the setup right here is that you're doing mar classic Buffett style margin of safety balance sheet first investing. If you were buying these stocks, like I was, you know, six months ago. Um, but you have the upside of like the internet over the next 20 years, right? Like, like the Bitcoin has the potential to grow hundred X or 200 X over the next 20 years. And of course, if you're in the infrastructure business at this time and you choose any of the companies that are still around, like that's like saying, all you have to do is choose out of 50 companies, just choose three or four or five that end up surviving 20 years like Amazon, right. Or Apple. And you will, you, you will do, you'll do pretty well, right. You'll, you'll, you'll probably do very well. Um, and in, at various periods of time, people will think like, how did you know, right. That, that this is going to happen. And of course, nobody knows for sure, but in this case, I, I think there's just so many clues uh, it almost, I almost, it's like hitting a fastball from a good pitcher in slow motion. Like it's a, it's going to be a big hit. Um, and it makes it easier when you can see the ball so clearly coming at you in slow motion, you know, exactly where to swing. Um, and so I, I, I like, I like the space a lot and I think it's going to completely change the energy infrastructure business too. That's the other point that I would make. I think it crosses over in the real world, uh, much more directly. Um, than a lot of other sort of digital technologies, because again, you, you know, the hash rate and proof of work systems do require physicality. They do require the usage of, of real world energy. It's part of what makes it secure and safe. And you think about the classic like energy business, like the oil majors, like a Chevron or an Exxon Mobil, right? They've got, they're, they're drilling like in the far North They're they're fracking in some cases, right? They're, they're, they're in the midstream business. They transport the fuels, they're in the retail business, they actually own service stations and they actually interface in some context directly with consumers. But there really hasn't been any change in the fundamental model of, of harvesting hydrocarbons and then delivering them to the market over the last, call it 50 to 100 years. But Bitcoin mining might, might, might shift the economics quite substantially um, because it, it makes renewables, especially stranded and excess renewables, much more valuable and useful, right? Like if, if you have uh, power that's being wasted, like, like it's being fra it's, it's, uh, being flared to the atmosphere because you don't have any way to transport it, right? You don't have a battery good enough yet to, to hold the solar power, excess solar power energy or excess wind energy. And so that sort of just dissipates, right? You can, you can actually use Bitcoin as a monetization method for power that otherwise wouldn't be economical. And so I think that, you know, like everybody's focused on renewables anyway, but the question is, how do you make them actually competitive. Well, one way is to, to, to use Bitcoin at every access point, essentially to your energy network that is currently under monetized. Um, and I think, I think, I think some of these big energy companies are going to start to figure that out. Like a lot of what you see now is JVs, right? Where somebody, uh, an energy producer, somebody who owns an energy asset is kind of doing a JV with a miner and the miner sort of responsible for the design and the the, the, which machines to choose and how to run them and the analytics and the, and the data and the operations of it. But the power producer is sort of the one who's supplying the power, usually at a cheaper cost because they're benefiting on the other side as the customer, right? As the end user of that, that power. So you're seeing that, like, I know you had Tyler on this show from Cypher, but like his partnership with Wind HQ, which is actually quite slick and right uses really low cost, basically free uh, power, but it only works when the wind is blowing. And so his team's built analytics to like predict in advance uh, when the wind's going to blow and when it's not going to blow. It turns out that actually adds incremental value around the edges. And of course, Cypher has one of the highest gross margins uh, in the business, right? You also see JVs with like some of these folks like Crusoe Energy that, that do, you know, work on the actual well pad, like with folks that own, own assets. I think, I think that's all going to be really interesting. And I think over time, these businesses become more anti-fragile if they can do on and off grid mining, right? Because then they're not subject to the grid. Um, they're not fully subject to the grid at all times, right? They can also still be generating revenue even when the grid's having issues. Uh, the other interesting angle, of course, is the way that the Texas miners are curtailing and actually sort of making the entire grid anti-fragile by being a, a high volume, you know, industrial grade buyer of power during normal times when energy is abundant and cheap, but being able to completely curtail to zero during periods of time where the grid's under pressure and, and energy prices have gone up, that incentivizes during normal times more investment in energy infrastructure, right? Because there's a there's a known large scale buyer who can always be offering you revenue on all those new investments that you're making 
but it also during times of any stress on the grid allows for a large percentage of the grid to essentially dial down to to a low state or a zero state and that that's quite interesting like you just don't see that in very many other markets um last point i'll, I'll make because i could go on on this subject but like deregulated versus regulated markets is another interesting delineation because in a deregulated market you have that opportunity for curtailment um, in a regulated market you have a sort of an opposite problem which is that because the utilities have to earn a regulated rate of return say five or six percent if large-scale users like in canada pulp, pulp and and paper etc industries move out that removes demand on the grid which then actually increases the power prices for every other user on that grid because again the, the utility has to by government mandate earn this regulated return and the only way to do that is to have a, a certain amount of revenue and if so if a big chunk of that revenue goes away it needs to be soaked up by somebody who again is industrial scale who can replace that demand from those kind of physical industries that have gone into decline um, so there's just so many interesting angles here and i think what's going to happen is that these uh these these large miners are going to end up getting integrated into large-scale energy infrastructure and and large-scale oil major type businesses where they can plug in these businesses at various parts of their infrastructure and dramatically increase the efficiency and the profitability of the whole thing while skewing more and more towards renewables, which is sort of what, uh, where the whole world is going at this point. Yeah, pretty much agree with all of what you just said. I feel like a lot of people have been speculating on like when a large energy company might acquire a public or, or large private Bitcoin miner. I guess eventually that's going to happen. Also flipping it around, like, do you ever see, you know, if, the next bull market is crazy. Bitcoin hits five hundred thousand dollars a coin, and you know Bitcoin miners are you know fifty billion dollar market cap companies. Do you ever see them acquiring like energy facilities themselves, or how do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. So it's a full stack business, right? Like if you own the power asset, then you know you can actually control the entire uh, the entire production process. Uh, from from the very start to the very end, you know, actually generating Bitcoin, um, you know, from from your self mining operations. So I could see that being being a trend that happens at some point. You know, there's always like consolidation phases, right? And, and then and then there's the unwind uh, of that where everybody's doing spinoffs and everybody's trying to build pure play companies again. You see that in all industrial businesses over time. They consolidate as people think there's efficiencies scale efficiencies, cost synergies, revenue synergies, et cetera. And then they get so big that they become unwieldy uh, like a GE. And then you start selling off the business because you realize a pure play air conditioning business or a pure play medical device business or pure play oil business is what the investors actually want. They don't want to own all these exposures collectively. They want to own them individually. And so I think you know, there could be a period of time where it's viewed as passe. Um, sorry, not passe, but it's it's viewed as sort of naive to think that you really have full stack control of your business uh, without actually controlling the underlying power. Because if you have a five-year power contract and at the end of five years, your power uh, provider says, look, we need to triple the power cost. Um, but you've spent hundreds of millions of dollars to put your facility in a, in a location to mine that specific power source, then you're kind of beholden on that, that power producer, right? And so that's why people are doing these JVs I think where to sort of incentivize that power producer to to you know provide that power over long periods of time at a at a reasonable cost, um, and and I think like there's a spectrum there, right? You could do it as a just a two separate entities that have sort of no economic uh, shared incentives. You could do it as a JV where you kind of have fifty fifty type, or you could just own the the power producer itself at the right price. And I think the question is, what currency are you using to to make that M and A decision? Because you're right. If if some of these miners are trading at a fifty or hundred billion dollar valuation, and natural gas producers are still trading in the single digit billions, maybe it makes sense to buy a power producer with with fracking operations all over the middle of the U.S. and literally just plug in your mines directly into your power and sort of monetize your power directly versus selling it to someone else or or monetize some large percentage of that power, and that way you can control your mining operation in perpetuity. Uh, and you're buying it at a, at a time where the public market's giving you this currency, which is Bitcoin and your equity that's sort of inflated by a bull market and you're using it to buy hard assets in the real world. The only issue over time is, again, 
that business might get to a certain point and then it might start underperforming the pure play miner that doesn't own the power assets because the blended margins are lower because it, the traditional power business is not as good of a business during the bull market. And so you, you may get a valuation compression if you try to combine too many businesses that are not viewed as, as sort of pure play, frictionless digital businesses like, like mining really is. Now, of course, if you own land and buildings already as a miner, you're already in the physical business. And so you're already limited uh, by the physical world to some degree, and you're limited by the amount of CapEx that you can raise and deploy and the number of transformers you can buy and the number of machines you can buy. But I think that's what makes Bitcoin great. It's always somewhat constrained by the physical world. It is always somewhat linked to the physical world. And you just can't say that about Ethereum, uh, Solana, uh, or any other token that, that's gone completely proof of stake where it's just sort of make-believe fantasy land how many tokens there are. And it's make-believe fantasy land that there's any governance that's going to pre prevent people from from violating your property rights or for taking away your coins or, or changing the value of your coins or changing the protocol in some fundamental way that impairs the value. Uh, you just don't have to worry about that as much as Bitcoin. And part of that is that fundamental constraint of the real world. 100%. Yeah. I mean, Bitcoin is, in my opinion, the least uncertain money, at least on a long, long time horizon. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. It's kind of been a hot topic. I feel like on Twitter recently is like the idea of diminishing returns in future bull markets. It's obviously been a trend that from 2013, 2017, 2020 slash 2021, like the bull markets got a little bit smaller each time. There's been like some people talking about like, hey, maybe, you know, the last bull market was capped due to the China mining ban or like paper Bitcoin from FTX or, or whoever. Do you think, you know, we're going to see that trend continue of diminishing bull market returns? Or do you think it's possible that the next bull market could, you know, be larger and more significant than the previous one? I think it's both. I think both are possible. And I think the way I think about it is if you just follow the trend right now you get to probably like a 65,000 to 160,000 peak price would sort of be in that kind of diminishing returns uh, range. But if you look out longer, like 20 years out, if this is really going to be the most important money in the world, and it's going to be the store of value that everybody uses, right? If it becomes ubiquitous in the world and every central bank holds it and every country clears their large scale transactions with it, uh, over time, then of course there's going to be some bull market in the future that on an absolute basis and maybe even on a relative basis is more significant, right? And so I, I, I'm coming around to the idea that like my baseline understand, my baseline projection should be based on this diminishing return kind of trend, right? So that would put us at like a three to 10 X uh, from the bottom of this cycle, right? Like four to 10 X maybe, right? So, so 16, if you think 16 is the bottom, four to 10 X would be less than kind of 20 X last cycle and kind of the hundred X the cycle before that from, from the very bottom to the very top. Um, and so th that's, that's if we just have sort of a normalized diminishing return bull market, but at some point in the next 10 years, the way I think about it, like Bitcoin's probably going to be a million 500 K to a million dollar assets. So there is somewhere in there, whether it's this cycle, next cycle, or the cycle after there's going to be a, a bull market that probably Maybe it doesn't exceed the previous ones on a on a percentage return basis because you just have this larger and larger numbers. But on an absolute basis, in terms of the amount of wealth it creates, it's going to create far more wealth than the previous cycles. And so I don't think it really I don't think you need to predict that perfectly. You just need to track the fundamentals that that show you that that long term trend of, of adoption over 20 years is, is happening, because if that happens, the price will sort of follow that line pretty closely with with some mania periods, both to the upside and downside where it overcorrects, right? It goes, it runs far past uh, sort of true fundamental value on the upside as it did sort of in 2017. Like it wasn't worth $20,000 in December of 2018, but it also wasn't worth $20,000, right? In February of this year or January of this year, like it was, both of those were the wrong price for different reasons, right? The, the infrastructure was far newer uh, in 2016, 2017. There wasn't enough of it. There, there was barely like any really utility for, for people who were mostly coming in to speculate because they saw the price going up and people were talking about it at Thanksgiving versus now there's all this new utility coming, uh, with lightning, right? The, the pass rate is, 
it's vastly safer now for, for, from an immutability and a safety standpoint, like the chain's less likely to be 51% attacked. The hash rate continues to go up. I think that's a nice leading indicator of how the market views the value of the network broadly. Um, so, so again, I think, I think the answer is both. The answer is both. It's likely that the returns on a, on a relative basis go down. Right. But, but in terms of the absolute value creation on, uh, from an absolute size, like I think there's trillions and trillions of dollars of additional value just in the next three to five years. And we're at a 500 billion, right? Valuation right now, a little over 500 billion. Uh, I haven't, yep. I've barely, barely been watching the, the details. I find that it's very helpful for investing to spend less time <laughs> looking <laughs> just at the numbers all day long. But um, yeah, I think, I think it's, I think it's possible that we have a stop and start. So, so you could actually see this cycle, a return that's higher than the previous cycle. And the other thing I'd say is I'm not sure we're going to see 85% drawdowns every single cycle going forward. So like it's possible we, we only go up five or 10 X off the bottom over the next two years, but then we only draw down 50% next cycle. So then when we resume the next bull market after that, we reach higher levels on a compounded return basis faster because we never went down as far as we did before. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that last cycle that we wouldn't fall more than 50% this cycle. And then we did. So hopefully it'll, <laughs> hopefully that won't happen next cycle. Well, if you look at it the other way though, like, thank God you had one more chance to buy Bitcoin at 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 25. Uh, who knows? It's possible, right? Like that we're getting close to the end of the sub 30 level. It happens quickly. And then, and then you look back and like, now it's pretty clear to those of us who've been around for a while, we're never going to see sub three. Bitcoin again, but I remember distinctly in December of 2018 going into 2019, like there were a lot of people who, you know, were just still nervous that Bitcoin was going to go lower again. It was going to go back to a thousand. It was going to go back to 800. Yeah. Back to, every cycle, it's the same, it's the same thing. And it's fun to, to, to try to predict those levels and to think about those levels. Cause that may give you some insight onto where to place your bids if you're interested in adding. But in general, like it's a fool's game to be trying to sell tops and buy bottoms in an asset like Bitcoin, because over the long run, it will accrue purchasing power. And most people who get too cute on the trading will have less Bitcoin five or 10 years from now than they do now. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I remember 2018, 2019, people were like, you know, Bitcoin's at $3,000. Oh, it's going to fall to like 1300. And people, like hardcore Bitcoiners were, were saying that like, hey, like you sell some Bitcoin, like you're going to be able to buy it cheaper. And then all of a sudden we had the summer 2019 run up and it was off to the races. Do you think that we could have something like that occur again in, in this cycle? Like before the next halving, could we run up to like 50,000 and then crash back down next mm -hmm. sometime next year and, and then have like another parabolic bull cycle? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's probably the way it is going to happen. Actually. I think we probably, I don't know exactly what the structure is going to be, but my kind of base case forecast is for like 40 to 45 K Bitcoin by the time of the having or just after like within a quarter. So the having happens in like April next year, probably by next summer, we will have, we will be in that 40 to 45 K box at least once. Right. And so that, that gives you a year to go from basically 30 to, to 40 to 45. That's a good return right, for most asset classes. Uh, for Bitcoiners, it's, it's considered to be like nothing, right. Cause people want two X, five X, 10 X type of type of returns. But but I think that's where we'll end up being, right? That's just kind of like production value, hash rate, like thinking about just like, what are the fundamentals of Bitcoin? Like, I think that's the right level for that period. That said, like if we, because it's so reflexive, if we start to move higher, like next month, or if we start to move higher in the fall of this year and, and we blow through that area, then we could certainly run up closer to all time highs before the halving. Um, we could do that immediately after the halving and then we could pull back again back down into the high thirties or forties um, and then make another run from there to, to eighties and hundreds, like into, into 2025, 2026. And, and so like, again, like I don't, I don't think it matters exactly what those numbers are, but we do need to see the price move up in that window, right? Like between 2024 and 2026, we do need to see at least getting back near the all time highs. That would be like my absolute baseline for, Hey, things are on track. Uh, what happens after that is, is, is who knows, right? Like if, if the right succession of things happen, there's no telling where it could go. Of course, of course it can go to 300 or 400 K. Like we saw it do stuff before that no one thought was possible. In fact, every time you think Bitcoin can't do something, it almost always does it. 
And so I've, I've stopped saying, Hey, it can or can't do this. I don't know for sure what it can do, but I try to build like a realistic mental model for what, what path I think it's likely to take. And then that's sort of drive your investing. Like when thinking about the miners, for example, there's something kind of implicit going on right now. If you buy a miner that is essentially selling a lot of equity to buy a lot of machines right now to plug them in, because they're essentially saying, uh, we think the price is going to go up. And so therefore we're willing to dilute the share, the existing shareholders. We're willing to borrow money. We're willing to do whatever it takes essentially to buy more capacity, whether that's through buying uh, facilities, buying machines, et cetera. There's another group of miners that's not diluting as fast, that's being conservative, that's sort of growing at the rate of the market, that is sort of agnostic about the price, but is not certain that it's going to go to all-time highs anytime soon. And if the price stays at 30 or 25 or or 35 or whatever, by the having, they don't want to be out of business and they don't want to be uneconomical at that level and they're being more conservative. And so far this year, like it's not clear that um, you know one strategy versus the other is better. At certain points during the year, the miners that are being more aggressive seem to be being rewarded by the investors, usually after they give a presentation at an investor conference showing how much their exahash is going to go up under the new forecast. Um, and then others that are being sort of more conservative and saying, we don't know what's going to happen with the price, but we are going to be in business no matter what, right? Because we're not going to borrow money. We're going to operate at cash flow, uh, break even or better. We're going to liquidate Bitcoin if we need you to pay pay bills and, and to not have to take on debt. Uh, but there's but there's sort of like a bifurcation going on right now between miners on various parts of that that spectrum. And if of course, if the price rockets higher, the most, in a sense, irresponsible, aggressive, over-levered, uneconomical miner wins, right? Because if if the price were just go to 100,000 tomorrow, you'd, you'd have wanted to literally borrow two times the company's market cap. You would have wanted to buy and ship machines, right? You would have, you would have wanted to be super aggressive. You want to dilute the shareholders all you want, like print uh, double the shares you have outstanding. Who cares? Because at $100,000 Bitcoin, the only thing that matters is how much capacity you have to take advantage of that profitability. But if Bitcoin sits at 25K or 30K and then the halving happens and essentially your costs go up, double in a day, or, or you could say your revenue goes down, um, you know, all of a sudden there's gonna be a whole bunch of miners who were being aggressive, borrowed too much, printed too many shares, and they're actually not economical because their margins weren't good enough because uh, they never forecast a world where Bitcoin doesn't go into a bull cycle. So, you know, you know, I, I'm sort of agnostic. What I try to do though in my investing is to own situations that are, have true asymmetry, meaning if the price goes up more than expected, they should do well. But if the price goes down more than expected, I won't lose any money, right? Play essentially play defense, and so that that kind of dictates my sizing when I think about like you know how should Alpine Fox own exposure to that space? Yeah, I definitely think Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining is like all about survival. It's you know Bitcoin does eventually, in my opinion, go on these parabolic bull runs. But it's like when halvings occur, especially if you're a miner, you got to make sure you can survive the the winter that comes when your, you know, block subsidy gets cut in half and you make less Bitcoins. Um, so yeah, completely agree. Uh, Mike, thanks so much for coming on. Where can the audience go, you know, learn more about you and learn more about your fund? I don't do any marketing at all for the fund, to be honest. I, I actually only have one LP besides me and I tend on keeping it that way for a while because I've, to be, be candid, Joe, I'm having the most fun I've ever had in my career. I just get to focus on investing and I don't have to do a lot of administration or IR or anything like that. Um, so, so not looking for investors, but happy to continue to be a member of the Bitcoin industry and periodically show up on, on this, this uh, podcast and other podcasts. But, but in general, I'm, I'm pulling back a little bit from the public persona and focusing more on just generating investment returns. So I'll be in my little man cave here uh, working and, and mostly I don't want to be pinged. <laughs> so, so, so you're always uh, welcome to, to reach out, but I'm mostly going to be kind of hiding out here now. Understandable. If I had my own fund, I probably would be doing the same thing, <laughs> but this is awesome. Thanks so much, Mike. All right. Thank you, Joe.